Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back for this Burlington House Lunchtime Scientist Talk. If you've been tuning in week after week, you'll have noticed that I wasn't here last week. So I am particularly excited to be back for this talk about space materials. Hi, my name is Lucinda and I work at the Royal Astronomical Society, which encourages the study of astronomy, solar system science, geophysics, and other closely related branches of science. Yes, hello. It's so great to have you back, Lucinda. Uh, my name is Joe, and I work at the Linnaean Society. Uh, and if, if you've been tuning in, you know that we aim to inform, involve, and inspire people about nature. And we do that through our special collections, our programs, and our scientific publications. Our two societies both live in Burlington House, this big, great uh, building in the centre of London, alongside other cultural organisations such as the Royal Astronomical Society. Oh, you're already in here. The Royal Academy of Art, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Geological Society and the Society of Antiquaries. One big cultural family. The Linnaean Society and the Royal Astronomical Society have co-produced this series for young people with an interest in astrobiology to learn about the exciting field and the variety of careers that people can have. Yeah, this webinar is taking place on Zoom and it is also streaming on YouTube. So if you are watching this live, you can type questions or comments in the Q&A boxes and our speaker will try to answer them at the end of their presentation. On to our speaker who is Dr. Emma Ryan, who is a senior development engineer working to improve the efficiency of materials and machines for use in the aerospace industry. Beyond this, Emma is the events coordinator for the UK Mars Society and has championed the promotion of women in STEM in several organizations. I am very excited to listen to Emma's talk today. Thank you for joining us, Emma, and I'll hand it over to you. Wonderful, thank you very much for that introduction. So yep, yeah, as Lucinda very kindly introduced me, I'm Dr. Emma Ryan and I work as a rocket scientist at a company called Reaction Engines. I've also worked at various other organizations and predominantly um, my area of focus is on materials that we use in space. But before I go on to the technical details of my job and which materials are used in space, I'd like to take you on the journey of how I got to where I am now, working in my dream job, building um, engines for rockets that will go into space. So I'll be talking about my early years. So I was born in uh, 1991, so I'm going to be 30 this year, which is slightly terrifying for me. I then went on to study um, my GCSEs in 2008, and I did triple science, history, astronomy. Um, and I now am the very proud owner of a very big telescope, which I love, which got me interested in space and also um, in physics, which I studied at university. But I also did geography, drama and French because these were three subjects I really enjoyed. And in fact, um, history was one of my favorite subjects, which I'll go on to uh, talk about. For my A-levels, I did maths, further maths, English lit as my um, fun subject and physics. And out of all of those, English lit was in fact my best subject although I went, on to, um, I went on to study physics. So you don't always have to do what you do best at, you can do what you most enjoy. In 2010, I went to university and studied physics as my undergraduate, and then went on to work as an intern at the Astronomy Technology Center in Edinburgh at the Royal Observatory, uh, looking at stars, which was awesome, but also uh, building telescopes. So particularly the very large telescope, which as the name suggests, uh, is very large and that's in South America, and looks at um, galaxies very far away, which was really, really cool. So as you can see, my path is on the, uh, is on the page there, and I've taken you through my GCSE, my lay levels. Um, I went to university in 2010, did an internship at the Royal Observatory in 2014, and then went to do a doctorate um, in material science to give me the necessary skills I needed uh, to work as a rocket scientist. And I then began doing that um, in 2018, and I've been at my current company, for uh, just over two years, so coming up three years now. So I'm gonna be talking in detail about these various steps along my journey and um, what went well, what didn't go so well. So although I am now in my dream role doing exactly what I've always wanted to do, um, it wasn't an easy path. And I think you always hear about people's successes and what went well, but you never really hear what went badly. And I just like to share those to be as transparent as possible and to make you realize that there's a story behind everyone and not everyone has had, um, well, no one really has had um, an easy path to do what they want to do and things um, 
but things are worth uh, putting in the effort for. So um, I put in lots of photos of me to make it um, hopefully a bit interesting. But my early years, so when I was um, at primary school and secondary school, my highlights were that I loved school. Um, Hermione from Harry Potter is absolutely my spirit animal. She's my absolute hero. And um, I think I'm very like her in lots of ways. I really enjoyed school. I answered all the questions in class. And I luckily went to schools where that was okay. It was okay to like maths. It was okay to like physics. It was okay to enjoy learning. And I really appreciate um, that opportunity and that feeling where I went because that just continued at university. At university, you're just surrounded by people that love learning and have gone to university to learn more. And I had that feeling at school as well, which I think really set me up um, for my academic career and to where I am now. As I mentioned before, um, I really enjoyed English Lit and that was in fact my favourite subject and my best subject as well. Um, so although I've gone on to study physics and engineering, I enjoyed lots of other subjects. And in fact, part of the reason I've gone on to study physics, um, and I don't know if you guys have had the same experience, but was actually because I loved history. So I really enjoyed history. I wasn't very good at it because um, I had to consider other people's points of view, which I didn't enjoy doing. But I got to learn about things that happened in the past and I just think it's really interesting. And then I realized physics is really like the epitome of that. When you look into the night sky, when you do some stargazing, those stars are in the past. You could be looking at light from millions and millions of years ago and it's history happening right now. And I just thought that was really interesting and really counterintuitive and really mind blowing. And I wanted to learn more, which is why I went on to study physics. Also, one of the highlights I had at school, and I hope you guys have had that opportunity as well, is our school trips. And I got to go to China, which was um, really, really great. And I've chosen a career where I get to continue um, traveling and going to new and exciting places. Um, the lowlights at school, I just study a subject called citizenship. Um, we were forced to do it. I didn't like citizenship. <laughs> so I liked most subjects at school, just not that one. I also didn't get, so we're talking about people that may have failed or not done as well as um, they'd hoped. I didn't get the A-level grades for my first choice. So as I mentioned, I went to Edinburgh University and I needed three A's to get into Edinburgh. And I didn't get three A's, I got two A's and two B's. Um, so that was a bit of a knock to my self-esteem. I'd always done very well in exams and very well academically. And I didn't get into that university that I wanted to. Um, I was very fortunate. They did accept me. So I got through um, clearing. So despite not getting the grades, they still accepted me, which I was very thankful for, but it did um, slightly knock my self-esteem, but it hasn't stopped me academically. It hasn't stopped me becoming a doctor. So don't be put off if you don't do quite as well as you'd, um, you'd hoped you would do, and you'll still get to go uh, where you want to go. I also didn't get to be head girl, which I was really hoping for, because I liked looking up in exams and seeing people's names on the wooden boards where they'd had head girl and head boy. And I didn't get that either, which um, I was a bit upset about, but these things happen. So what I learned from my early years, from school, from where you guys are now, is that learning's great. I love learning and I haven't stopped learning since school. I think the other point is don't compare yourselves to other people. So I was disappointed with my A-level grades. I didn't do as well as I thought I should have done, but I didn't mind what other people got. So there were lots of people that did better than me and they deserved that. I wasn't comparing myself against other people. It's just what I knew I was capable at. So I think particularly with social media nowadays and lots of other aspects of um, life nowadays, it's very easy to feel like you're not doing as well as others or you should be doing better. But as long as you do the best that you can do, um, that's the important thing. And even if you don't do as well as you can do, it isn't the end of the world. So um, I found that was a very important lesson to learn. And my dad gave me that advice and it's helped me kind of all throughout my life, um, which has been extremely helpful. The other lesson I learned at school, so I talked about being Hermione, I said yes to everything. I did open days, I did um, like the Maths Olympics, I don't know if that's still going, loads of events like that and got involved with loads and loads of stuff. And what that did is it taught me lots of new skills, like how to talk to people, how to interact with people, all these networking and social skills that are really, really important throughout life, both at university um, and also at work because you have to work in teams. So by saying yes to all these events, I got to go to really cool stuff. I got to meet James May from Top Gear, um, but I also helped me develop as a person. So I really um, do encourage you to be as enthusiastic as possible and say yes to things, get involved with things. That's how I um, met Lucinda and it's how I got involved with the Mars Society as well, which has been 
completely awesome. We got to watch fireworks from the top of a very snazzy bar in London, which was uh, good fun. So what I'd like you guys to do now is I've got a series of questions um, in my presentation and you can join them here. So you can probably see that link there and then there's this code word here. So if you put in that, you'll be able to interact with this presentation along the way. And even if you're watching it um, not live, you can still submit your answers to the questions. So the first thing that I would like to know, having spoken about Hermione, is what um, Harry Potter house do you think you're in? So I've got these really cool coasters that if you put a hot drink on it, changes the color of the coaster to tell you what house you're in. And if you're able to answer that, that'd be great. You can do it on your phone, you can do it on your tablet. I can see somebody thinks they're Hufflepuff. Someone thinks they're Slytherin, interesting choice. For me, it's between Gryffindor and Ravenclaw. Although whenever I do the questionnaires online, I always get a Hufflepuff. <laughs> oh, wait there, my thing's about to run out of battery. Excellent. Fantastic, I'm glad to see fellow, some fellow Gryffindors in the room. <laughs> Fantastic. And the other thing I'd like to know is what's your favorite subject at school? So I spoke about mine being history, even though I went on to do physics, but I'd love to know what you guys are interested in as well. And if you've had a chance to study astronomy at school, I know not every um, chemistry is a good choice. I also love drama. <laughs> I used to want to be an actress and then realized I wasn't very good at drama. <laughs> Anything and everything, good choice. My boyfriend does um, biology, he does um, biological engineering. So he's getting to cure cancer at the moment. So his, um, there's lots of cool jobs out there in engineering. I also like the fellow physicist. <laughs> Physics is a really good subject to study and uh, I'll go on to why I think it is. Uh, my best friend studied international relations and she got to work at the UN, which was uh, quite cool. So I'm still, um, please feel free to continue to answer that, but I'm going to continue on if that's okay. And hopefully some of you will, uh, will like astrobiology if you get a chance to study it. So I then went on to study a physics degree, which was um, awesome at the University of Edinburgh. And there were lots and lots of highlights, but I've focused on a few there. So I got drunk with Professor Higgs. So some of you in the audience may have heard of the Higgs boson which is a fundamental particle and it's um, proof of its existence, um, got proved 2014, so about seven years ago now, um, but it was hypothesized way back in I think the 50s or 60s. So Professor Higgs was one of my lecturers at university and we got to celebrate him winning the Nobel Prize uh, when he got that. So there was lots and lots of free wine, which was great. And it just felt like I was part of history. So at my graduation, he got awarded keys to the city, um, which was really, really cool. The highlight was also achieving a 2-1, so in so that's like a B equivalent, um, or you get different grades now in GCSEs, I don't know what the equivalent was, would be. So you get first 2-1, and I got a 2-1, even though I um, failed my first year of university, and um, I did struggle a bit in the first couple of years because I had to adjust to um, living away from home and being independent, but also studying quite a hard subject. So I was really, really pleased when I got that result because I think it was... Um, yeah, it was what I wanted and it's um, as well as I think I could have done. I also had an awesome final year. So you can see that photo on the far left. I um, spent my final year looking through a telescope on the roof of the physics building. So this building was about six or seven stories high and I got to use that telescope to take images of the sun. And I did an entire project um, on features of the sun. So the kind of solar flares that you get um, and various other factors. So that really, really kind of cemented my love of astronomy and stargazing and space and physics. And um, it was really, really good fun. Plus it was quite sunny that summer. So I got to like work on my tan. And um, the other great thing was that I got to do a project, a group project on astrobiology. And that 
again, I already love the idea of um, like aliens and life in space and all that sort of stuff, but that gave me the technical research and the technical knowledge behind it. So my tutor for that was a um, guy called Professor Charles Cockle, who some of you um, may be aware of. He's the um, probably world leader in astrobiology, but certainly the, um, the prominent person in this country. And he was my tutor for that. And we did it all around um, microbes in space. And I learned a lot doing that. Um, and microbes behave completely differently in space because of the lack of gravity. Well, it's microgravity. There's a little bit of gravity in space, but not what we um, experience here on Earth. And so because of that, microbes behave completely different. They've evolved here on Earth where we have gravity. And then to be in an environment where that doesn't happen, their behavior changes. And this has lots of different effects, including, they think, um, our immune system. So astronauts, when they go up to space and then come back, their immune system is worse than it was when they went up. And they think part of that is because of how the microbes change in microgravity that affects um, our body, basically, because our body is something lovely like 60% bacteria. So um, that was quite cool. So I spoke about getting a 2-1, um, and some of you may have been in a similar boat to this. I scraped my 2-1. So it's 60% for a B, for a 2-1, and I got 59.9%. So luckily they, um, they round up, but um, yeah, it was, uh, I'd only just got it, which I was, as I said before, very used to doing well at school. Um, and then at university, it became a bit more of a struggle. So um, I found that a bit difficult. The other reason um, I perhaps didn't do as well as I'd hoped is I got appendicitis in my final year. So um, I had to be off for four months and I have this really tiny little scar. I was hoping for like a really cool pirate scar. Didn't get that, got this little tiny scar. But I got appendicitis in my final year and it really kind of messed things up for me. I had to miss a bit of university and it meant I wasn't as kind of focused or settled as I'd hoped to be. So um, that was a bit of a problem. But I learned a lot from those um, situations. So help is always there if you need it. So although I failed my first year, I had the support of my tutor, so like my teacher and other people around me to help me make sure that that didn't happen again. And um, everyone struggles from time to time. So although now if I tell people I'm a doctor, they obviously must think I'm like very successful academically. That's not the case. I failed my first year and I scraped a 2-1. So um, it's just to be aware that everyone has a story and everyone struggles from time to time. I don't know anyone at university that didn't find some part of it difficult. Um, and also, if you have a stabbing pain on the right hand of your belly and you're finding it difficult to walk, you probably have appendicitis. That's also what I learned at university. <laughs> so um, I'm interested to know if you guys have ever met a Nobel Prize winner. I have presented this question once before and people have uh, met one. So um, I think my dad met Obama um, at his job, which is quite cool. And he's won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and there are a few other Nobel Prize winners floating around at universities in the UK. Well, I consider myself very lucky to have met Professor Higgs. <laughs> I'm wondering, Lucinda, if you've ever met one. Not as lucky as you, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And I'm also just wondering, obviously, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, um, but wondering if you've ever failed at something. Um, so I spoke about my academic kind of failures. I also failed my driving test four times. Um, so pro tip here, if you crash in your driving test, uh, automatic fail. <laughs> so I don't recommend doing that. So somebody is very, very good then if they've never failed at anything. Just you wait till your driving tests. <laughs> Fantastic. But most people, I think, have failed at something. No one is perfect and no one knows um, exactly what to do first time. And I'll speak about this um, in more detail when I started my uh, current job as well. So going to university, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. I don't know if everyone in the audience wants to go to university. I thoroughly recommend apprenticeship schemes as well. But unfortunately, I don't have direct experience of that. I chose the path of going um, to university. There was a number of reasons I chose to go to university above um, other options like a BTEC or a diploma, or as I mentioned, an apprenticeship. Um, and it's because at the time I was really, really interested in physics, um, particularly astrophysics. And so in order to do that and have that technical expertise, university was the most straightforward choice, not the only choice, but the most straightforward choice. So for me, it was a step on the path to my dream job. Um, I also went to university in Edinburgh. So I don't know if anyone in the audience has ever been to Edinburgh, but it's an amazing city. That's the castle that I could see from my flat window, from my bedroom window. 
and there was always loads going on. Um, we had the Edinburgh Festival. There was just lots to do. Um, and it was really, really awesome. And I loved living there. I also met some amazing people. So there's a photo of me and some of my friends um, on my physics course. Uh, and they were just lovely people that were just like me. And that's the really good thing about university. You can, there's so many people at university that you um, meet that it's, you know, you can meet other people like you that are interested in the same things as you. Um, for example, I uh, learned to study massage at university, which was quite cool. And um, I was surrounded by other like-minded people who were also interested in like yoga and relaxation and that sort of stuff, which was, um, which was good fun. But there's like skiing societies and all sorts. So um, lots and lots of great people at university. As I mentioned before, it was, um, it was quite difficult. Um, it, physics particularly is a very um, tough technical subject. And not every choice I made was good. So one of the reasons I uh, failed my first year is because it was the first time I'd lived away from home, but also I went out drinking and partying a lot. And that meant that I wasn't focused on my studies and it was a very, very expensive mistake. So when I went to university, um, tuition fees, I think are about a grand and a half and um, living costs are about six grand a year. I think they're now tuition costs are nine grand. So imagine adding that extra cost onto uh, onto your student loan. It's a lot of money. So I don't really don't recommend failing your first year. And it knocks your self-esteem as well because you don't really feel good enough and stuff. So um, so yeah, don't make good choices. <laughs> and also I felt very alone sometimes at university. You feel like all the struggles that you're going through, you're like doing on your own. It's not the case. As I said before, help is always there if you need it. And it's really good to talk about things. But at the time I hadn't realized that. So sometimes I did feel um, quite alone at university despite being surrounded by people. But I learned a lot. I learned from my mistakes. I learned to say no to things. So I learned to say no to nights out. And in third and fourth year, I really didn't go out that much because I was really wanting to get my degree and do well. Um, but also say yes to things. So if someone asks if you want to learn how to do massage, say yes to that. If someone asks if you want to go on a like skiing trip, go for it. It's these opportunities that you'll only really get at university. Um, and it's a lot cheaper as well than doing it later on in life. So um, yeah, I did really love university and I, um, I thoroughly recommend it. So I'm just wondering um, if anyone in the audience would like to go to university. It's absolutely not the only option, but, um, but it is a good one. But you're even through the apprenticeship scheme, you're able to then get a degree afterwards and they pay for it. So there um, are lots of options out there and I can answer lots of questions on um, different possibilities. So I then went on to work as an intern. So I worked at the Royal Observatory. You can see like a snazzy photo on the left-hand side and then the photo that I took that's not so good uh, in the middle. And this was one of the best experiences of my life. So my job was building parts for the Very Large Telescope, as I mentioned. Um, that's slightly wrong. It wasn't to detect life on other planets. It was, although the technology could be used for that, it was to detect galaxies um, very, very far away and look at like proof of the Big Bang and that sort of thing. Um, other highlights include Donut Friday. Um, so Donut Friday was a Friday where we got free donuts um, and people at the observatory would share their research, which was um, really, really good fun. It was also the first time I'd worked in an international community. So there were people from all over the world working at the, um, at the observatory, like Americans, Europeans, people from the UK, people from South America. And it just, I got to experience a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different lifestyles. And I really appreciated um, all of that diversity. And everyone was so friendly and lovely, despite the World Cup going on and everyone like in competition with each other, everyone would just go watch the uh, football matches together and cheer on each other's team. So it was just an incredible place to work. Um, low lights, there was a massive, so the observatory, like all observatories, have to kind of be um, up high to minimise light pollution and minimise distortion from the atmosphere. And so this observatory um, was up a massive hill. And the first time I did it, I had to have a break halfway up the hill because I was so unfit. And so um, that walk every morning was a struggle. Uh, I also worked hungover a few times. I don't recommend that. And the other low light was that it finished. I wanted to stay there forever, but unfortunately um, at the end of my internship, they couldn't offer me a job. And so I had to go and find um, another option, but I would have quite happily have stayed there. It was um, great. I also learned that I didn't want to stay in academia. 
So um, at the observatory, half of it was PhD students studying astrophysics and half of it was engineers building telescopes and other um, instruments. And I realized that I much preferred building tangible things that could then be used rather than studying like little like bits of light on a photograph that was very complicated and difficult. Um, so yeah, I realized that I wanted to be an engineer at that point and I wanted to actually be building things and not stay in academia. I also learned not to drink on school nights and that donuts are an effective means of bribery. So um, yeah, if you offer free food at events, I'll probably be there. So just wondering if you guys would like to do work experience or an internship. An internship is typically when you're in university, a little bit older, but there are also um, opportunities for work experience while you're at school. I did my work experience in the Waterstones. I don't recommend it, but there are lots of engineering companies out there, lots of science companies, lots of other companies that can offer a uh, really good work experience. Oh, awesome. Well, I'll look forward to uh, hearing what work experience you guys would like to do. Oh. And just wondering if you guys have ever done anything for free food. <laughs> Whoever hasn't is a better person than me. <laughs> We used to have stuff at uni where they'd offer free pizza, which was uh, pretty good. <laughs> Interesting. So I wonder if you've been offered free food to come to this. <laughs> uh, so I then went on to study an engineering doctorate. So although doctorate sounds um, academic, my an engineering doctorate, as opposed to a doctorate in philosophy, a PhD, um, is based in industry. So it's more like having a, um, having a first job more than... Um, more than anything else, rather than having to stay at uni and continue doing exams. So one of the main highlights is that um, I wrote an international standard based on my research. So an international standard is like a set of rules or a set, yeah, kind of that are in law that people have to abide by to make sure that the stuff they're making is good enough. And so I feel like I made a real impact because my research has resulted in like people having to do what I say, which is really cool. <laughs> So I just feel like I've made um, a massive, massive difference, which is an awesome feeling to have. Like my research was useful and what I did was important. Um, so my research was on additive manufacturing, or you guys may know an, by another name, which is 3D printing. And there at the bottom, you can see some of the machines that I worked on to um, additively manufacture my parts. We additively manufactured parts for space. And I'll go on to talk about that in detail, particularly the properties needed for those parts and how we made them. Uh, another highlight is not paying council tax. So although it was like a first job and I got paid the same as you would for a first job, I didn't have all like the bills that you might not ne that you necessarily have when you start your working career. And um, the other highlight is I'm now a doctor. <laughs> so this hasn't still hasn't really hit me, even though it's been like two, three years. And I know I've spoken about it like a lot during this presentation, but I'm really proud of my achievement. I worked really, really hard and I had... Um, a lot of setbacks during my doctorate um, and a lot of not great things happen, but um, but I managed it and I completed on time and my parents now address everything um, to me with doctor on um, to embarrass me in front of the postman, but really I love it, <laughs> which, is, um, which is awesome. And it's um, incredible for me from going to failing my first year at university and not getting very good grades, sort of A-level and GCSE to then becoming a doctor. Um, it's really, really cool. And there's me at my graduation pulling a stupid face. So uh, you're welcome. But there were low lights. As I said, the doctorate was quite difficult. There were lots of late nights. Um, I didn't have a weekend for about a year trying to finish stuff. And it was all on me to get it done and get it finished. I didn't have, although I had support, I didn't have like teachers giving me detention if I didn't do my homework. It was all on me to do that. And it's um, a lot of responsibility and quite a bit of stress, but it was uh, worth it in the end. About halfway through my doctorate, I have no, what's known as a confirmation. So you have similar stuff at school, or at least I did when I went to school where you have, you know, like a report with your teacher and they say how you're doing and stuff and they send it home to your parents. This is similar. It's like a check on your progress to see how you're doing. And I got utterly destroyed. Um, my writing style, I wasn't very good at writing reports. Um, some of the results that I had weren't very good. Um, and I was still learning how to be like a good engineer and a good scientist. Um, so although it was really tough and it was just two hours of being criticized in that confirmation, um, I then learned a lot from it and it helped me finish on time and helped me finish a really high quality um, bit of work. 
And the other low light is the first two years. The first two years of my NG, so an NGD is four years long. The first two years didn't count for anything. I didn't contribute towards my final report at all. I did a lot of learning in that time and a lot of developing, but it actually I had no viable results from those first two years, which isn't uncommon. That's quite normal. Uh, so I learned that you can learn from failures. So I had all those kind of criticisms during my confirmation, but I became a better writer. I be got better results and all that sorts of stuff. Um, I got a good student discount on loads of bits and pieces. So this is relevant for you guys as well. Um, as a young person, you can get really cheap things like National Trust and English Heritage, which I thoroughly recommend. Um, and also when bad stuff happens, you've got to, I'm not gonna say these words because they're naughty, but it kind of comes from Winston Churchill. He used this phrase KBO. And what it means, it means keep going, um, even when things are bad. Um, you will come out the other side and like this too shall pass. So this is a bit more depressing than I meant, but <laughs> it's meant as a good thing. Um, so would you guys ever want to do a doctorate? I know it's a, a long way off because I think you guys are still at secondary school, but is there anything anyone's ever been interested in? So there are some kind of careers where a doctorate, it's not needed, but um, there are some careers where a doctorate does help. Um, it just kind of gets your foot in the door and proves to the rest of the world that you kind of are as good as the, you say you are. You can say no as well. I never thought I could, would do a doctorate. The only reason I chose to do one is because I couldn't afford to do a master's. <laughs> The master's is very, very expensive. I didn't have 20 grand lying around, unfortunately. Um, so I spoke about like the uni, the, the academic side of so, uh, doing an engineering doctorate, but I also worked for a company called Lockheed Martin, who are a very large um, Fortune 100 company, and they do um, loads and loads of really cool stuff. So they do fighter jets um, and other bits and pieces. They worked on things that have gone to space, um, and they're a very famous, famous organization. So this provided me with loads of networking opportunities and helped me get my current dream job as a rocket scientist. We also got Fridays off, which was um, really, really awesome. So we did sort of nine, 10 days in nine. Um, so every other Friday we got off, which is um, a lot of American companies do this. Um, and I, when you start looking for jobs, I do recommend it. One of the lowlights was though, I had a lot of responsibility, like I had to get my work done, but I didn't have any authority. I was like bottom rung and I couldn't like shout, you should never shout at anyone, but I couldn't ask, tell people to get stuff done for me um because my bit was in research and development and it was very much like bottom of the pile of importance because we had customers like um that we needed to get stuff done for so I found that really difficult I was really trying to get stuff done and it wasn't happening um but I learned a lot in this time as I've mentioned before there's no such thing as soft skills so people often um, say that, oh, being able to present and being able to talk to people is a soft skill. I actually think that's a much harder skill than like quantum mechanics and stuff. It's very hard to teach, but it's so important to have because if you work at a company, you will have to work in a team, you'll have to work with other people. And so it's important to be able to communicate with those people. Uh, paperwork is important. I learned that the hard way as well. Um, when I first started, I called everything sample one. I had about 20 sample ones. So when it came to writing up, um, I had to like completely redo everything. Don't ever call anything sample one. <laughs> and the other thing I learned is that people have other priorities. So although I needed my work done, everyone needed their work done. And so I learned how to communicate with people so that we could all um, work together. And also as part of my um, part of working at Lockheed Martin, I got to go to Montreal and New York. So Montreal, you can see in that image on the right hand side, um, I got all expenses paid to go to a conference in Canada. And it was awesome. And I, I really recommend it. Uh, so would you guys like to travel at all? It's quite an important thing for me. I love traveling, but I'm just wondering if you guys um, would like traveling. And when COVID is uh, all over, where would you like to go? New York's very expensive and China's amazing. Mars, I love that. <laughs> so my heart, I'm with you on that. It, I've got goosebumps right now. I'm so cold. <laughs> I'd quite fancy the moon. I'm not sure I'd be able to um, go any go as far as Mars, but I definitely um, like the moon. The beach, also okay with that. All good choices. I recommend. I do recommend Montreal in Canada um, as well. And I'm sure you guys will get uh, lots of opportunity to go places. CERN is also an awesome choice. I'm really annoyed. I 
we were meant to do a school trip to CERN when I was in sick form. And I was the only person in my class that wanted to go. So they couldn't fund it properly. And I've been, it's literally like one of my biggest regrets. I would have loved to have gone to CERN. I've got some um, friends that work there. Cornwall is an awesome choice as well. Cornwall's lovely. So what I do is, um, why I love working as a rocket scientist, as I said, it's what I've always wanted to do. Um, I get free coffee at work, which is um, great news. Not every company does that. And that's sort of considering um, the staff and people like that is really important. We have a PS4 in our common room. We have a ping pong table. We have a snooker table. Um, and free coffee just kind of embodies that philosophy and thought process. And the company's really flexible. And that's been really important during COVID. So right now I'm working from home. I'm in my dining room. I've been able to go into the office, but they've been really understanding of everyone's um, situation. Some of the lowlights, um, the traffic, traffic's really bad. And also going into this job, it wasn't an area that I had any experience in. I'd come from additive manufacturing, this 3D printing. And what they then wanted me to do is work on something called brazing, which is where you join um, two bits of metal together, typically in an oven. And I didn't really have any experience of that. And I had to learn very, very quickly. So I felt like I was just on my like first day of school again, um, having to relearn everything. I um, learned a lot. I have learned a lot working here. It's the um, social aspect of work is just as important. Um, so as I mentioned, like the ping pong table is awesome. Don't rush into things. So um, I wanted to sort of just learn everything about brazing, but I wasn't expected to. There are other people at my organization that are experts in brazing and I could learn, but didn't need to suddenly have to know any, everything. Oh, and the other thing I learned was don't put aluminium in a braze furnace. So our braze furnace um, costs lots and lots of money, sort of millions of pounds. And if you put aluminium in it, it breaks. <laughs> and then one day I got some aluminium and some steel confused and tried to put aluminium in the braze furnace. Now, luckily, one of my colleagues noticed what I was doing um, and saved me and saved me getting fired, basically. Um, but mistakes do happen. What makes this more embarrassing is I spent my four year doctorate studying aluminium. So I really should know uh, what aluminium looks like. And I'm a metallurgist. So that's the type of material scientist that studies metals. So, um, yeah, you should know the difference between steel and aluminium. So people make mistakes. So in the last few minutes before questions, um, I'd like to find out what your dream job is. And then I'll go on to kind of talk about space materials quickly and um, astrobiology. So I don't not everyone knows what their dream job is. Um, you may not know yet. And that's OK as well. Marine biologist is awesome. So is biochemist. These are just really exotic, awesome things to do. I'd never heard of any of these things um, before university. Astrophysicist is a really good choice. And astronauts are pretty cool as well. So obviously they're looking for um, astronauts at the moment. The UK uh, European Space Agency has put out a training course. So one of my colleagues was on that show, like how to be an astronaut. Um, Vidal and he got I think he ended up third um, you've got to be like really physically and mentally fit so I probably struggle <laughs> TV presenters are pretty cool one so I've been on the BBC presenting live comedy um, although it was BBC regional radio and not on the telly <laughs> those are all um, yeah very very good choices and one of my friends is training to be a psychologist which is an awesome choice so before I go on to talk about materials in space, I would like you guys to let me know if you know anything about like risks in space, hazards in space, things you'd have to consider when picking out what materials you want to use in space. So for example, yeah, temperature. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I was about to say. Bacteria, excellent. Yep, yeah, cosmic radiation. See, you guys don't even need me. Vacuum is definitely one. Yeah, yep, to distance, yeah, because you need it to get away. Acid, yep, so you've got to consider corrosion, acid rain, you've got to consider corrosion and all this sort of stuff. Okay, this is, um, I'm going to move on just because of time constraints, but please continue answering and you are absolutely right, like with all of this. Um, so some things that I've had to consider during my career, um, so someone mentioned um, vacuum, so you have to consider high back vacuum and how the materials will cope under that. You also have to consider compression because of the um, because of the vacuum and if your material going into space is pressurized at all. You've got radiation from the sun because obviously you don't have your atmosphere up here. I think someone mentioned distance, which is kind of the weight thing. It's got to be as light as possible to be as cheap as possible to get into space. 
You've also got stuff like impact from like asteroids and other stuff in space, as well as like satellites that are already up there. Um, you've got to consider gravity. Temperature came up quite a lot. A acid rain sort of comes under corrosion. So this is um, like rust is a type of corrosion and, and also vibration. So obviously as you're sending stuff into space, it's gonna vibrate loads and we need to make sure it doesn't break. Um, my job is mostly breaking stuff to see how, uh, how strong it is. So we've got to put materials under all these different aspects to see um, how they'll do and if they'll break at all and if they'll get damaged at all. So we've got some different temperatures here in space. So the main part of my job is making sure that the materials perform at all the different temperatures they'll experience. So here we've got absolute zero, minus 273 degrees C. Um, it's theoretical, it's never been achieved, but the average temperature of space is very, very close to this. Um, if you guys want to put in the chat what you think the uh, temperature of ice is, of icebergs, so obviously naught degrees, the average temperature on Earth, obviously this might be a little bit different from, say, Scotland to Australia. This is about 20 degrees C. Rocket and jet engines typically experience 2000 degrees C. And then the sun itself is 2 million degrees C, which is uh, pretty hot, probably too warm for a, uh, a holiday. So I've got to make sure that the materials that I use are OK in all of these different aspects. And in fact, when they go into space, it's more around this kind of minus 150 to about 270 degrees. So, um, so it's very difficult to find materials that will basically behave well at all of those temperatures. So here's an example of it. This has been 3D printed or additively manufactured using a process called WAM. And here you can see an example of it. And it's a fuel tank for, um, for satellites. So the fuel will be stored in here. And this has got to contain the fuel. The fuel is pressurized. And also the fuel is quite dangerous. It's, um, it can be very um, corrosive and attack the metal. And so I had to make sure that that didn't work. I also had to make sure that the um, material is strong and that it won't melt at hot temperatures or become brittle and like break or snap at cold temperatures. And another important thing is it's got to be lightweight. I think it's about 50,000 pounds per kilogram to send something up into space. So um, this material is aluminium and that's what I studied um, a lot of. And aluminium is used a lot in space. The other reason for that as well is because um, when it when stuff like satellites fall back to Earth and come through the atmosphere, you want them to burn up so they don't land like in your living room and destroy your house. And so aluminium does that, whereas a material like titanium, which has similar properties to this, um, doesn't. So going briefly on to astrobiology in the next kind of minute. Um, the most important thing with space materials is not only that it's OK, against all of these things and doesn't break at all. So we, ESA, who are based in the Netherlands, have test um, centers where they test against radiation and compression and all of these things, which is quite cool. But also you've got to make sure that what you're sending into space is clean. And I think someone mentioned this, that bacteria is one of these risks. And it comes from really um, a variety of different places, but mostly a moral one. We've got to make sure that we're not contaminating other planets like Mars, for example, with the rovers that we send up. And it's very easy to contaminate um, space material. And you've really got to make sure that doesn't happen. And also, because if we do find aliens on other planets, we want to make sure that they're real aliens and not like bacteria that we sent up. So there's lots and lots of different ways to make sure that parts are not contaminated. One of the ways that we do at my work is this is our braze furnace. It's a very, very large vacuum furnace. And if you put stuff in that at high temperature, that kills off all the bacteria. That's one way of, um, of making sure there's no contamination by baking things out at a high temperature. Now this can go up to like a thousand to 1500 degrees C, but you can also do it at sort of like above hundred degrees C for a prolonged period of time. So that's one way of cleaning things. Another way is a clean room. So we have a clean room at work as well. Not quite like this. This is, um, I believe at Airbus, the Mars Rover. But these are people obviously in clean suits. You've got to keep your beard covered. You've got to keep like my bush of hair covered. You've got to wear gloves. You've got to wear like specific clothes that you change into. There'll be cleaning rooms. You have to have a shower the night before because if you have a shower that day, then your skin cells are more likely to drop off and contaminate. So there's very, very strict rules around a clean room. The other thing that I've had to do in my career is something called fungus susceptibility testing. So when you get a material, it's got to be a material the bacteria doesn't like growing on. So there's a really, really cool test where you dip it in loads of like fungus and gross stuff. And then you see if fungus grows on the, um, 
on the material. And if it does, you can't use it. This isn't just for space materials, this is for um, aerospace as well. So that's like one of the many kind of environmental tests you have to do to make sure that your space materials are suitable for space and won't affect um, the natural astrology that there might be on any planets. And there's lots of other cool tests in um, aerospace and space that I'm willing to go on in detail if you ask me in the questions. But this is the main one from like a bacteria and cleanliness point of view. So a lot of um, a lot of people's jobs is making sure that parts going into space are clean. For example, some of the stuff that's gone into space, one of the Mars rovers, I think they had to swab it 110,000 times I was reading um, to properly make sure that it was clean before they went into space. So there's uh, a lot of work uh, to be done there. So that's all I really wanted to say. It's very, um, very detailed on my path and a very little bit on space materials, but hopefully that's um, kind of explained what it's like to work in the aerospace and space industry. I look forward to any questions. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Emma. How, uh, how was that for you? Is that, was that fun? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I love talking. <laughs> Great. It's really great to hear your uh, your highlights and your lowlights and lessons as well. It's, it's a good way to frame every part of your experience. Um, and this talk has felt like a really a realistic insight into a career. I mean, any career really, but particularly your career academically um, and within this engineering sector. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Fantastic. I've noticed there's a few questions in the chat that I'd like to answer, if that's OK. Uh, yeah, uh, well, well, what I'll do is I'll, um, Lucinda and I, just to give us something to do, we'll present those to you, those questions. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll, we'll just have to go. We can go and have a cup of tea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll look yeah, at okay. several different places for questions as well. But. Yeah, we'll insert some of our own. I mean, I'm particularly interested in, um, and, and my organization is particularly interested in sustainability and reducing waste and impacts. Uh, and space exploration is kind of known for leaving stuff behind, like satellites in space, for example. Is there a movement like you were suggesting towards sustainability in this sector? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a lot of work going on at the moment from the European Space Agency, and I think NASA as well, on um, what's known as space debris. So this is um, objects in space, mostly satellites that are no longer being used um, and are causing disruption. And various organizations and universities and institutions are looking at various different mechanisms to kind of collect all that up. And then basically kind of one idea is having a massive sale where you like kind of catch them all in like a big parachute thing and then like kind of drag it down a bit and then let it burn up in the atmosphere. So the earth kind of has its own natural um, disposing system. Um, so that's one way of doing it. There's also um, stuff's only being funded if it's what's known as demisable. So as I mentioned before, aluminium is sometimes preferred because that burns up easier in the atmosphere. So ESA were only looking at supporting projects where they consider sustainability, that it wasn't going to damage the earth in any way, and that you weren't creating unnecessary waste um, at all. So I think it is very important. It is very much a focus um, at the moment, and lots of people are working towards it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lisa, did you have any questions? I absolutely do. I, I love your talk. I loved how much you shared about your personal path and all the, you know, failures and, and the roller coaster ride of it all. I think it's really important to share that, you know, the path to where you want to go can be bump, a bumpy ride, but it can also be lots of incredible, um, you know, experiences and opportunities that you had, like you mentioned, um, meeting, uh, was it a noble? Um, yeah, Professor Higgs. There we go. Um, so yeah, amazing. So uh, just take it all as it comes and just try to do your best to enjoy the ride. And um, I was, so just really thank you so much, Emma, for sharing so much of yourself for us um, during this talk, because we want to give students an opportunity to see what it's like and what's the path that they might um, be interested in taking or what it might be like for them in the future. So we do have some questions about things uh, since you have a background in astrophysics, which is just amazing. You know, congratulations on also finishing your PhD and all that stuff. Um, but uh, we had a question here about if you have any suggestions on what uh, kind of telescope you would recommend for beginners. You know, um, we always get these sorts of questions at the RAS, but what do you think? Oh my goodness, I should know what my telescope is. It, I know it's a sky watcher. Um, and I can't remember the exact which one it is, but it's massive. 
Um, what I would say, so when I went to buy my telescope, I didn't want to spend loads of money on it because it was the first telescope I was buying. And so I was looking sort of around like the two, three hundred pound mark. But when I chatted to the gentleman, um, it's in this incredible um, astronomy shop in London. Um, it's part of the, Irregu uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, who are this incredible astronomy group in London that use the observatory in Regent's Park. Um, so I got advice from them. I ended up spending um, 700 pounds on my telescope because I know, <laughs> worth it though, it's awesome. You can see um, like Jupiter and the rings of Saturn and stuff. Um, and I will try and find out um, what telescope it is, I should know. Um, but he just recommended, you might as well go for the more expensive one because you're going to end up getting that long-term anyway. And you'll have to learn regardless. So yeah. go, for the, go for the better one. <laughs> I do like starting out or recommending binoculars, especially if there's someone young, it's really great to just be able to realize how much more you can see in the night sky with just that getting started with that. Um, I, I also wanted to ask one more question, Joe, about um, you know your connection with space and this work that you're doing um, and kind of the exciting thing that's going on around the world with all these other um, international uh, you know, countries going to Mars and more recently, China, you mentioned you had been in China as part of your uh, earlier experience on your path to here, um, but there's some exciting stuff happening in China. We, you know, we, you think about your own future, I guess, maybe, because I've even considered me, me possibly moving to China. I've been working with Mars education in China because there's so much interested. So if something opened up in China, would you possibly kind of use your talents and skills there to push space forward? There are, I think, amazing things happening in China. So I think um, any country where they're pursuing space exploration is uh, where I'd want to be. You know, what, what do you think about sort of their, you know, their program, they're sending humans up, they're building a space station, all that exciting stuff. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely something that needs to happen. Um, we need to, we haven't been, you know, back to the moon since the 70s, but I know it's happening again. And I think people want to see real things happening in space and with exciting organizations like Blue Origin and SpaceX, everyone should be getting involved and yeah, doing these exciting things. I wanted to talk a bit more about biology, I guess. Um, we've had lots of speakers and I think you're, am I, am I right, Lucinda, that you're the engineer? I'm not sure we've had any people who are more engineer focused, um, but we've had loads of different people from different disciplines. And how, how do you in your either daily life or annual life or just career work with other disciplines how, how how does that work for you yeah absolutely so at my organization we have a range of different subjects that work there so we have what you'd expect like engineers but even within that there's loads of different types of engineers we have chemists we have um my boss did his phd on quantum mechanics something theoretical <laughs> quantum physics and is now like building real things um yeah we do have like biologists I've come across um, quite a lot as well because they input into different parts of kind of space exploration and um, space development. So it's very important to get their um, input. I work with chemists. So working on a spectrograph, which takes kind of um, electromagnetic radiation and analyzes it to tell you what you're looking at. Um, that's a lot of chemistry work. Uh, material science, which is what I studied, it's, um, you know, it's a combination of lots of different subjects. It's a bit of chemistry, a bit of engineering, a bit of physics, but it's not just these um, like kind of scientific subjects that I've come across. I work with a lot of people that have backgrounds in like English lit, in um, like graphics and all those sorts of, like all those skills are needed um, in a variety of different careers. And all those creative skills are an important part of, um, of engineering as well. So you need to be able to present your work and have nice posters with all your results, results on. It's not just the like maths and the science. Um, there's a variety of different skills that are needed. And going back to when I studied astrobiology um, at university, there was a woman there who was doing a PhD in astrobiology. Her first degree was English Lit. So she was incredible. She was absolutely amazing. But she went from this, you know, two very, very different subjects, but just from the kind of um, transferable skills and being able to analyze data or in English lit, like sources and um, novels and stuff, you could use those skills um, and go into astrobiology. So um, I don't think there's any limitations in that regard. Yeah, you paint a really uh, enriched picture of this astrobiology family, space family, mm -hmm. uh, which is really uh, nice to hear. I have the smallest question. Um, which is from Ernie and 
Oh, I'm really sorry, my, my cat says hello. <laughs> and maybe your cat can answer it. Um, what's your favourite physics equation? Oh, I saw that. I, I mean, the only one I can remember right now, this is really embarrassing, is E equals MC squared, which is obviously a very, very important one. But there's, I do have um, another one, which I'm embarrassed you're going to have to Google. <laughs> um, it's the, the spring equation. How do I not know this off by heart? I should do. Um, so it's like something to do. God, I'm really sorry about this. this. Is what happens when you start the world of work? You have all this theory and like the arrest. Yeah, law or anything like that. Hooke's law. That's what it is. Yeah, oh Hooke's law, not the spring equation. Because <laughs> um, Hooke's law just has like implications across so many things, and it's um, it's just a really, really, really important one. So yeah, F equals kx. That's um, a great example because it's used and taught in GC astronomy, you know, sorry, GCSC yeah. physics, I should say, actually. So, which is what I've taught. Um, so it's probably pulled that out of there somehow. <laughs> you just end up using it like so much more than you even realize. And it's so fundamental. And it's to me what physics is all about. You start from the fundamentals and go into like the complex and the sublime and the ridiculous. So, um, yeah, I would say that's my favorite. And I'm very embarrassed that I couldn't remember it, but... <laughs> there we go <laughs> that's one thing working for the royal astronomical society and people think that oh gosh you know everything i mean i have to constantly remind them we don't i don't know everything you know my background's geophysics not astrophysics so <laughs> i get all kinds of questions about that so i also love the fact that you guys did uh, donuts uh friday donuts i think it was which made me immediately think of black holes in the taurus um which i think are absolutely appropriate donuts. yeah definitely <laughs> Um, Joanna, if you want to wrap up, I definitely would love to ask uh, Dr. Ryan if there's anything she wants to kind of leave our audience with uh, about either the, her work or her path to where she's gone. No, just the kind of, I think what I mentioned earlier, just say yes to things. So get involved with events like this, go to the Royal Astronomical Society, go go into London and see stuff. It, like, is it the Linden Society as well? Linnaean, so yeah. Linnaean, sorry, yeah. So just Pop get into the Royal Astronomical stuff. Society, we're next door. <laughs> That's right. We're good friends. We're next door neighbors. <laughs> and just learn as much as you can and never stop enjoying learning. I haven't. Well, thank you so much, Emma. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. And um, El Elise is saying thank you so much for your awesome talk. And I am <laughs> just wrapping up here. This has been uh, the seventh in this year's series of Astrobiology Talks. And it will, it will be uh, the last for this academic year, unfortunately. But um, we have seen some amazing feedback of people who might have future careers as astrobiologists. And so we will be returning in September with three further talks to wrap up this year's Burlington House Lunchtime Scientist Series. We're gonna be uh, looking at exoplanets, this whole idea of um, building blocks for life in atmospheres of planets, and possibly uh, on meteors, uh, those ones that were found recently in the UK looking for life. So lots of exciting things still to come. So it's a goodbye for me, Lucinda, at the Royal Astronomical Society. Yeah, and it's a goodbye from me, for, um, Joe, from the Linnaean Society. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye for now.